So as you can see, I'm on a double shift today. Daddy. No, no, no. Don't make a big deal out of it to you. Until you hear what I got to say, then you can do all that while I'm preaching. But, uh, you know, before we get started, I just want to go ahead and say thank you to the head of this house, the pastor. He's not just my father, but he's my spiritual father. And uh, he doesn't have to trust me with this, but he, he, he gave me the opportunity and the privilege to do this. So give it up for your pastor, Pastor Shane. Come on. Now, in his absence, you know, he, he left off talking about uh, spiritual warfare, spiritual territory, how to take back the land. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today, but from a different angle. And uh, as you can guess, I'm going to talk about it from the angle of worship. So today, I'm not just going to be demonstrating worship for you behind the piano and with the microphone and everything else, but we're going to teach about it. And the reason why is because I believe that worship is a tool and it is a weapon that we can use. And as we're going to get into the Word, you're going to see that worship brings about the anointing. And we're going to get into the text, and there's three things that I'm going to show you that we, when we engage in worship, the anointing comes, and then there are three things, there are three signs that will let us know when we are uh, acting in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So if you will, go ahead and uh, go to 1 Samuel chapter 10, starting in verse 6, and you can do that with your good old paperback Bible or with your cell phone or your tablet or your big screen TV whatever you got going on, but go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel. And as you're doing that, let me go ahead and give a little bit of information about why I think worship is so important. So there's a study that was done by the Barna Group. This group is a, a statistical analysis and survey group for Christian issues. And they did a study on worship, and one of the statistics that they gave is that four out of ten adults that go to church will admit that they have actually done something previous to worship, previous to service, to prepare themselves. So that means that 60% of adults that go to church have not done anything throughout the week or on the, mo the morning of before praise and worship, before they come in. 60%, I'm just going to go ahead and say it a couple times, 60%, that means in this room, about the first four rows of people actually did something before they came into the house of God today, expecting God to do something. Now, another statistic to go along with that is that 68% of people that go to church every Sunday say that they are actually excited to go. But that troubles me because that means that there's 32% of people that go to church that aren't excited. And it looks like some of the people, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say that. But 60% of people don't prepare themselves for church, and then 32% of people that do come to church say that they don't like it. That means that half of the people that come to church unprepared, because they are unprepared, they don't enjoy their time in church because they say that it is hard for them to connect with God because they have not had time to disconnect with work and with your kids. Come on, somebody say, amen, I've got two of them. Every day, it's like cleaning up a construction crew. So there, have to, there has to be a time for us to decompress, to prepare ourselves to go into worship. We should not go into the temple of God haphazardly. If you did that in the Old Testament, you got struck down. So 60% of people don't prepare. 32% of people do not enjoy their time in worship. George Barna, the man who directed this study, said, and I quote, without giving themselves time to clear their minds and their hearts of their daily distractions and other problems, many people will attend a worship event but never enter into a worshipful frame of mind. A large share of churchgoers do not pray, do not meditate, do not confess their sins, do not focus on God prior to any church service. And one of the consequences is that they find it is hard to connect with God. Again, this is part of the quote. Having never been taught much about worship. Having never been taught. But why, how is it that Christianity today, out of all of the religions, 
that have ever existed in humankind, how can we not be taught about worship in the house of worship that we attend? If you go to a mosque, you understand that your time there is in service to God. It is worship. If you go to a synagogue, you understand that your time there is a service to God. It is a form of worship. Any other temple or synagogue or, or, or church in the world, people understand that their time in that building is not just something that they check off of a list each week. It is a service to God. It is worship. You see, the word, we call this a church service, but what really we mean by that is that we want to come and get serviced. We want to come and get our oil changed. We have turned into a jiffy lube, okay? Your tithes and offering is what is your payment for you to come and get your oil changed, for you to get gassed up, for us to clean out your air filters and to get you on about your way. And I'm not saying that those things don't need to happen, but the real service that should happen in this place should be a service to God. So worship... Worship is something that is important, and I, I, I just, I know that I'm, I, I know that I'm your worship leader, and it kind of seems cliche for the worship leader to be teaching about worship, but I'm, I'm just telling you, I'm not just teaching on this stuff because I want to see more of a reaction from you, because I don't want you to, to, to goad on about how good I play piano, or how good I might sing, even though I don't think, I, th I don't think that I'm the best at those things. But I'm not teaching on this so I can see you interact more with me to validate me. I'm asking you to interact more to validate yourself as a child of God. I'm at, there's, there is something about worship that we can use it as a tool. We can use it as a weapon. We can use it to bring down an anointing of the Holy Spirit. So now that I, that's my introduction. So now that we're done laid... <laughs> I told you, listen, my draw might be a little bit slower this morning. We're going to lay some groundwork, but once I get it up, we're going to go ahead and pull both triggers, all right? So let's go ahead. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 6 through 7. I'm going to break it down as we read through it. It says, then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you. Notice the first word, then. That means that there's something that precedes the Spirit of the Lord rushing upon us. Then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, and you will prophesy and be changed into a new man. So this tells us that there's something that precedes worship. The Spirit of God comes in, and then once the Spirit comes in, there's something that happens. And after that happens, you will see that these signs come to you. So there are, there's, there's, there's things that we can look for to see if we are engaging with the anointing of God. It's not something we have to guess about. There are signs that will let you know whether or not your church is moving in the anointing. The Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you. You will prophesy with them and be changed into a new man, a different man, and it shall be when these signs come to you, do for yourself what the occasion requires because God is with you. Doing with yourself, that is a command. That means there's something that we do before the Spirit of God comes in. That's worship. The Spirit of God comes in. When he comes in, prophecy happens. People are changed into a different being. And after that happens, there are signs that we can see. And when we see these signs, then we put our hand on the plow and do something with it. Okay? So let us go in, in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do in this place today. Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word is life. Your word is bread. Your word is water. God, let it sustain us. Let it bring sustenance to our bodies. Let it give us strength. Let it build up our inner man. And Lord, we want to know how to worship you more, God. We want to give you the due respect that you are deserving, Lord, the honor and the praise and glory. And when we do it, Lord, we expect you to rush in like a mighty wind and to change all of us in the process. So, Lord, let us leave this place today knowing more about you than we did when we stepped in, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So this first little scripture that we read here, this is just a very small part of the story that we're going to get into today, and that story is the anointing of Saul as king. This passage is actually at the end of my story so now we're going to go to the beginning. So if you flip one chapter back into the chapter uh, 9, 1 Samuel, you'll see that there is a man named Kish, and his donkeys have gone missing. And his son, Saul, he calls upon him and he says, 
Saul, grab one of the servants and go look for the donkeys. And when you've got them, come back. So Saul gets one of the servants. They go looking. It says that they go through the land of Ephraim and the land of Benjamin, and they go through Shalisha and Shaalim. And it says that they come to a place called Zuf, to the land of Zuf. And Saul is ready to give up. He said, we need to just go ahead and throw, the, throw in the towel, take our losses, grit our teeth, and take it on the chin. We, we, we can't find them. We just need to go on about our business, go back home. But his servant said, well, hold on. We're here in the land of Zuf, and there is a man of God that we can go to. He's high in power and in favor, and he will tell us what the Lord has to say about our journey. So they go to meet Samuel. And Samuel, he is a prophet. He has already been told to be look on the lookout for a man to anoint him as the king of Israel. And when they find Samuel, he is preparing a sacrifice. Now, throughout the rest of this story, I want you to pay close attention to the, each time that you see a sacrifice or you see an offering or you see music or prophesying because throughout the whole story of this anointing, there's worship involved with all of it. Can I get an amen? Are you with me? Am I going too fast? All right. So they meet Samuel, and as they're meeting Samuel, he is preparing a sacrifice. And just like a good old prophet does, he tells Saul, don't worry about telling me about your problems. I already know your donkeys have been found, but I want you to have dinner with me tonight. They sit down and have dinner, and the dinner that they are partaking of is from the sacrifice that Samuel gave. You see, what would happen in the tabernacle or later on in the first and second temple, they would prepare a sacrifice and they would cut aside a portion that was there for the priests to eat and for the family to eat, and the rest was burnt and given to God. So here they sit down and he tells the cook, go get Saul the piece of meat that we set to the side. And it says that they brought him the thigh and all that came with it. Now remember this that they brought him the thigh and all that came with it because later on there's a point that we're going to tie there. So they wake up the next morning. Samuel is walking with him and he's about to send him on his way and he pulls out a vial of anointing oil. He pours it onto Saul's head. He kisses him and then he begins to tell him, you are the new king of Israel. You are the anointed king of Israel and you're going to go home and on your way there, there's three signs that you will see, and these will be signs to let you know it is confirmed. You are the king of Israel. So the first sign that we would see, starting in verse 2, he first tells Saul that you're going to go and you're going to see two men sitting underneath uh, a tree by Rachel's tomb. And those two men are going to tell you that the donkeys that were lost are now found. And this brings me to the first sign. You can enter into a place of worship that brings the anointing that takes back things that were once lost. Come on, your worship. See, this, this, this right here, I'm about to go in heavy on it. This is why your worship is important. This is why your response, whether it's preemptively before a victory or after a victory, your response should be crazy, radical praise and worship because there is an anointing that can come in that will bring back things that were lost, bring back loved ones, bring back friends to mend relationships, to bring back businesses and property and money, and most of all, to bring back the signs and the miracles and the wonders that... See, y'all aren't getting excited about this. And it hurts my heart because that, that just shows where we're at. We don't understand what worship does. Worship brings an anointing that will bring back the power that the church has lost. The filling of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, words of knowledge, prophecy, healing, the breaking of bondage of addiction, the casting out of devils, all of these things can come when we enter into a place of worship that brings the anointing. And it, you see, it makes me think of this song when I was a kid. It said, and I went to the enemy's camp and I took... But you couldn't just sing it, though. You got to do the, you got to do the. So I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. And I took back what he stole from me. And I 
Oh, yes, I went to the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me because he's under my, he's under my, <laughs> said he's under, yeah. So, but what I love about that song is it proves the point I just made. Preemptively, before going and taking that thing back, you have to enter into worship. That gives you the anointing. But then once you go back and get it, you put the devil under your feet, and you stomp, and you kick, and you run, and you dance, and you twirl around. So anyways, there is an anointing. The first sign that a church is working in the anointing is that that church will bring back things to people's lives that they once thought were lost. The second sign in verses 3 and 4, he says that you're going to go on from Rachel's tomb and you're going to meet three men that are going up to God in worship. One is carrying three kids, and that word there for kids actually means like livestock, like a small lamb or a calf or a small goat. Another man is carrying three loaves of bread, and another man is carrying a skin of wine. Now, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be doing some teaching on worship. Me and Dad are going to do some tag team preaching, and this right here is going to tie in to one of the messages that I'm going to talk about, taking you from the outer court to the inner court to the Holy of Holies, and how that represents and coincides with the livestock of the sacrifice, the bread in the, in the inner court, and then the anointing of the Holy Spirit in the Holy of Holies, that wine. And, but so we're, that, that, that's another thing. I got I to gotta stay focused. I got to stay focused. But he meets these three men, and he says, they will give you two loaves of bread. So remember... In the beginning, when he eats a meal and he, he says, give him the choice piece of meat, the thigh, and all that comes with it. So the thigh and all that comes with it was a specific part of the sacrifice that only the priests, and most of the time the high priests, would eat from. And then here you have another meal where they are giving him bread that is supposed to be a part of a sacrifice. And again, in the tabernacle, in the first temple, and in the second temple, the only people that would have ate from the table of showbread or eaten from the bread of a sacrifice would have been priests. So what this is alluding to is that there is a certain type of spiritual authority that is about to be given to him, and he's almost a type and kind of Christ that he is a king and priest. It is showing him that he has spiritual authority. And what I love about this is, so in the first verse that we, that we read, where it says at the end, and do whatever you see fit, that is a militaristic statement. That is a commission, a command to make a militaristic stance. So what is happening here is he is being given spiritual authority to be able to do spiritual warfare. And the reason why I know that's the case is because he says, after this happens, on the way to the next sign, you're going to come to a place called Gebeath Elohim, and that means the hill of God. And he said that place is positioned right in front of the Philistine garrison of the army. So he is giving him spiritual authority, and the next place he is going to, he is supposed to execute that authority in spiritual warfare. So... And, I, and I, as, I was wor as I was worshiping and asking God for a word for our church, you know, this, this place that he's going to, Gebeath Elohim, it's the hill of God. And I know that this is all anecdotal, but I was, I was like, Lord, our church is literally on a hill. And it's literally positioned within the worst part of our city when it comes to poverty and when it comes to drugs. And our, our city is not the worst city in the nation, but is in one of the most drug-infested areas in our city. We are positioned at the enemy's garrison. But we, again, we can engage in worship that will bring upon spiritual anointing and authority so that we can execute spiritual warfare. Warfare that takes land... You see, warfare is not all about defense. War is about offense. It's about expanding. You see, the book of Isaiah talks about the anointing, and it says that the yoke will be destroyed by the anointing, but that word there actually can be translated, the yoke will be destroyed by the fattening or the expanding. There is an anointing that can come upon you that the yokes and bondages that try to hold you down, sooner or later, they can't fit no more. 
That's how, uh, uh, see, uh, how I know that a church is working in the anointing is that it expands. It grows. And I know that sometimes we can look at bigger churches and say, well, it's all about the numbers and it's all about the money and it's a, it's a game. It's a game. Yeah. Well, some of that is true. But on the other hand, if you've got the same 50 people sitting in the church for the last 50 years and you haven't grown, you are not working in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I know that that might ruffle feathers. I'm sorry. Take it up with God. It's in his word. Change has to happen. Growth has to happen. Land has to be taken back. There is an anointing that will break the bondages. We have the anointing brings things back. The anointing brings upon us spiritual authority to do spiritual warfare. Again, Paul said in 2 Corinthians, he said that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or of this world, but they are divine and powerful for the pulling down of strongholds. The anointing is aggressive. The Holy Spirit can be very sweet and tender, but the Holy Spirit can also convict. The Holy Spirit can also urge. The Holy Spirit can sweep across a room and make people speak in other tongues and confuse everybody. So, the anointing through our worship can come down and bring back things that were once lost. The anointing can give us spiritual authority to wage spiritual warfare. And then the next step that we see in verses 6 and 7, where we started at the beginning, it says that you're going to go up to Gebeath Elohim, and you're going to see prophets there. They're going to have musical instruments they're going to have lyres and harps and tambourines. And he says that they're going to be caught up in a prophetic frenzy. And that when you get there, you will be caught up in that prophetic frenzy. You will begin to prophesy with them and you will be changed into a new man. So right here, we see a time of music being used in worship and how it is stirring up the spirit. It is stirring up the anointing. Prophecy is happening. Things are changing. That's why this is so important. We come up here. I'm not just playing songs to show you what I practiced this week. We're playing songs because it stirs up the prophetic anointing. And what is, what's happening here is, so he gets caught up. And what I can show you is that people... A, a lost person can come into this place and our worship can be so radical and so out of the ordinary but real in spirit and in truth that they don't have a choice but to be caught up in that worship with us. And I can prove it to you not just from this but later on in 1 Samuel chapter 19, David is running away from Saul. David goes to Samuel and he's trying to tell Samuel everything that's happening and Saul sends a messenger to go speak to Samuel. And it says that while they're there, there's another prophetic frenzy going on. There's another school of the prophets and they're caught up in their music and they're caught up in their worship. And it says that when the, the messenger got there, he fell into the prophetic frenzy. And then he sent another messenger because that one was taking too long. And it says that when he got there, he fell out in a prophetic frenzy. So Saul got so upset with it, he went up there himself. And it says that as he was on his way, he fell under the prophetic frenzy he took his clothes off and he laid on the ground all day so worship can be so powerful and so impactful that people step onto the parking lot and before they get in the building they start shaking before they get in the building they start crying before they get in the building they feel that there is an there's an intensity that there's an electricity coming off of this place and they can't help it but to come in come down to this altar get saved get filled with the holy ghost and start prophesying with us so a church that has the anointing is a church that brings things back church that has the anointing is a church that works in spiritual authority works in spiritual warfare is expanding and growing and then the third sign, I know I just went off into the prophetic frenzy, but really the most important thing of the third sign is he said, you will be changed into a new man. You'll be changed into a different person. When the real anointing of the Holy Spirit comes into a room, 
people are changed. Your worship is not just about your relationship with God. Your worship can stir something up to touch somebody else. It can change other people. It is mandated in the word. Matthew chapter, uh, I believe it's Matthew chapter 24. Jesus said, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And to the extent that you did it for the least of these, you did it under me. There is something that the church, the church is mandated to make a difference in people who are hurting. The church is mandated to make a difference in people who are sitting in the jail cell, for people who are sitting in a hospital bed, for the orphans and for the widows and for the poor and the destitute and the marginalized. It is our job to work in an anointing that brings change to our area. And unfortunately, most churches, if they were to close today, the neighborhoods that they reside in would not know that there is anything different other than the fact that there's now a for sale sign on the property. Most churches are not making any impact in their areas. What we just did up here at this school, painting the walls, that might not seem like much, but what we just did was we just slid our foot into the educational system here and we're, we're, we're stepping in. So what happens now when we come in here and worship, the anointing from our worship now can reach out to that school and preemptively work on the hearts of children, work on the hearts of teachers, work on the hearts of parents to bring change to that area. Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, I believe it's verse 17 and 18, he opens up the scroll of Isaiah and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring the captives out of bondage, to bring sight to the blind, to bring healing to the broken, to proclaim the year of the Lord, the coming of the Lord. It is a mandate that our church creates a difference in this city. So now that, now that I've explained this, we have, we have the anointing due to worship comes in, and it brings back things that were lost. The anointing brings spiritual authority to create spiritual warfare and to take land. And the last thing is that it brings change. And now I want to do a little bit of an overview of this story and create a little bit of a parallel to what's going on now. You see, just as Saul and his friend were lost and looking for something, and they were searching high, and they were searching low, and they were searching far, and they were searching wide. Some of you see where I'm going with this. But just as they were out looking for something, and they were ready to give up, and they were ready to give in, I promise you, there's people out in this city that have been looking for something. They feel lost, and they're searching the highest of highs, they're, deeping, they're dipping down into the lowest of lows. They're going far and wide. They are searching for something, and they are ready to give up. They're ready to give in, church. They're ready to throw in the towel and to take a bow. They're ready to, to get at the end of their rope without any hope. Church, there are people in this city. But that's not where that story ends, though. One of them came to his senses and said, You know, in this city, there's a man of God that we can go and he's with power and he's with authority and he knows what the Lord has to say. I would it be to God that there would be some people in this city one Sunday morning, a group of friends that are out there lost and out of control looking for something they don't know what to find, where to find it, how to get it, and they're ready to give up, but that they would say, you know what, there's a church up on a hill in Cookville, Tennessee, that I hear something when I walk by, it sounds like they're going crazy, the worship is going, I hear them clapping, I hear them stomping, I hear them shouting, I hear them dancing, and there's something when I walk, woo! There's something when I walk by that building that there's something drawing me in. There's a power that I feel coming off of it and that they would walk into this place, that they would come down and get saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, and that they would get caught up in our prophetic frenzy 
and it doesn't end there. It says that Saul went back and everybody looked at him and said, what happened to Saul? Is he now a prophet? Those people, those drunk husbands, those kids that have been lost, they're going to go home to their friends and family and they're going to say, what's happened? Why did they act different? Why did they have joy? I thought they were depressed. But it starts with our worship. Church, it starts with our worship. It starts with our worship. I can, I, listen, I can tell. I can tell as a worship leader, I've been doing it long enough. There is a certain sound that fills the room. When everyone gets on one accord, when no one is holding anything back, listen, I'm not saying that, that you have to take off running and take off. Your expression of worship can be different. There's, Dad is going to teach on it. There's several words in the Hebrew language that represent worship. There's lifting up the hands. There's shouting. There's clapping. There's dancing. There's laying down. There's sitting down. There's standing up. There's spinning. There's several different expressions of worship. And can I, can I just be real for a second, y'all? Can I hurt some feelings real quick? As I'm leading worship, I look out across the congregation, and it hurts my heart. Not because people aren't doing what I want them to do. Not because you're not rolling in the floor. Not because you're not running across the pews but because there's no response. There is no response to worship. And it's not just me seeing it. There's people who have been at this church for a very short time, just started coming here, and have come to me and asked me why it's like that. Church, that should be a problem. We should fix that. And I'm telling you, just like the day of Pentecost, just before the Holy Spirit swept in and, and, and lights of fire rested upon each one of them, it says that there was a sound of a mighty rushing wind. When we come together on one accord, there is a sound that penetrates. You see, that's what worship is. You have this dimension and you have that dimension. And worship is the intersecting of those two dimensions. Your worship can literally bring heaven to earth. You are opening up a door to a dimension that you don't see. And when you begin to worship and praise and you are intentional about it and you're not just going through the motions and listen, I know life is hard. We go through it. There's times, honestly, there's times I come up here and I have to check my heart just before I start praise and worship because there's some Sundays I come in here and I don't want to do it. But I have to put my, my feelings aside. I have to understand it's not about me. As I said before, the service that we have is not a service for us. It is a service for him. So, so when we come in, I know you might not feel like it. I know you might not feel like it. But you have to understand that your worship in that moment might not be for you. Your worship might be for the person who has been leaving needles in this back hallway back here. The person that has been leaving spoons and lighters back here. We found them. I personally have found them. Steve has found them. Mom and dad have found them. Those people live right here, and your worship could resonate throughout this place, and one day they try to go down in that hallway, and they try to stick that needle, and before they do it, something catches them. There's something about your worship that brings the anointing of the Holy Spirit into this place. And there's, there's these three signs. This is how we will know a year from now. 
the, this church, it, even in its young state, we have already grown very much. We've, we, I mean, what we have done in the last year and a half has been nothing short of a miracle. But, we, but, but I'm telling you, what we are doing here, it will plateau out if we don't begin to understand how to worship, where to worship, why to worship, when to worship, and what happens when we worship. We have to begin to understand those things. And a year from now, we'll find out, have we been going and getting the things that have been lost in this city? We'll find out, are we waging spiritual warfare against the kingdom of, of hell in this place? And we'll find out if we're changing lives. So, so I didn't mean to hurt any feelings this morning. But I did. Because the Bible said that when Jesus taught, his words came like a two-edged sword, sharp enough to separate bone from sinew. So uh, sometimes we need to be cut deep. And really, I've been contemplating on how to end this service you know, prayer or worship or whatever. But uh, I can't lay hands on you and make you worship. Worship is a posture of your heart. It's something that you have to understand about God and yourself and your relationship. So, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and stand up. Worship team, come on back up here. Now, you know the adage that says you got to practice what you preach. <laughs> we're we're going to take that literally today. So we're going to, to go into a little time of worship. And once we start this song, you're free to leave whenever you're, you're officially dismissed. But I would urge you, come get your worship back. And if you've never really understood worship, if you've never really been in church long enough to understand it, that's okay, because some of us have been in church for a long time, and we've got it all jacked up. But what I'm telling you today, come before God, and just tell Him you love Him. Just tell Him you're thankful. Just tell him everything that he's done for you and say, Lord, before I ask you for anything, I want to thank you for everything. So if you will, just go ahead and shut yourself away. I urge you, step out into the aisles. Come down to the front. Kneel down, sit down, stand up, whatever you want to do. But let's go into a time of worship. Let's call down the anointing of the Holy Spirit into this place. Oh, I'm an overcomer. I'm an overcomer. By the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of my testimony, I'm an overcomer. 